Okay, everyone, uh, I think we're going to start the third session, Mapping Solidarities. I am very delighted to be the chair, and I will read the bios of the participants, of the panelists. Uh, Tarek Dana is assistant professor at the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He was director of the Center for Development Studies at Birzeit University, Palestine. He is a policy advisor for the Palestinian Policy Network, Al Shabaka, and a member of the steering committee of the International Political Economy Project. He served as the director for the Center for Development Studies at Birzeit from 2015 to 2017. His research interests include political economy, civil society, social movements, NGOs, and state building with a focus on Palestine and the Arab Middle East. Sarah Awartini is a doctoral candidate in the American Studies at George Washington University. She received her BA in history from the University of Florida. Her research interests include transnational and comparative history, cultural politics, and political culture, particularly that of Puerto Rico and the mainland diaspora community. Nadim Bawalsa received a PhD in history and Middle Eastern and Islamic studies from New York University in 2017. His dissertation is entitled Palestinian Migrants and the Birth of a Diaspora in Latin America, 1860-1940. His article, Legislating Exclusion, Palestinian Migrants and Interwar Citizenship in the Journal of Palestine Studies explored in greater detail the challenges Palestinian migrants faced during the interwar period. Nadim is a history and Arabic instructor in New York City. Amal Qaiq is a native Palestinian born in the city of at taibi in the Triangle in Palestine. <laughs> she is an assistant professor of Arabic studies and comparative literature at Williams College. Her research interests include modern Arabic literature and popular culture, Palestinian studies, feminisms, performance studies, translation, indigenous studies in the Americas, literature of the global south, and creative writing. <coughs> she received her PhD from the University of Washington in comparative literature in 2013. Her work has appeared in the Journal of Palestine Studies, Review of Middle East Studies, and Contemporary Levant, among others. Omar M. Sih Tazdal is assistant professor in the geography department at Birzeit University in Palestine. He holds a PhD in geography from the University of Minnesota. His research examines landscape and agroecological transformation in the Middle East and North America and has appeared in the International Journal of Middle East Studies and Being Palestinian, Personal Reflections on Palestinian Identity in the Diaspora. Our discussant is our own Ella Shohat, who teaches at the Departments of Art and Public Policy and Middle East and Islamic Studies at New York. She has lectured and written extensively on issues having to do with post-colonial and transnational approaches to cultural studies. She is the author of nine books, including Race in Translation, Culture Wars Around the Post-Colonial Atlantic, published by NYU Press in 2012, and most recently, actually the book launch was yesterday, on the Arab Jew, Palestine, and other displacements from Pluto Press. Her writing has been translated into French, Hebrew, Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Italian, Polish, and Turkish. So let's begin. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm glad to be here with you. My paper, I mean, <coughs> Compared to the rest of my colleagues' papers uh, today, uh, my contribution might have. Can you uh, Arab the microphone, Shwe? Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay, my contribution might have uh, less emphasis uh, <coughs> on the comparative dimension between uh, Latin America and the. Is it? Okay. Arab <laughs> microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My paper has uh, uh, less emphasis on the comparative dimension between uh, Latin America and uh, the Middle East, uh, specifically with regard to the uh, understanding the colonial question in Palestine and the uh, tr transformation of Palestinian and national movement in relation to those experiences of uh, Latin America. <coughs> Yet my contribution implies an important message 
uh, to those in solidarity with the Palestinian cause in Latin America and beyond, which concerns the dynamics and changes that engulf multiple levels, uh, structures, and functions of the Palestinian national movement in the past few decades. My work in recent years have been uh, focusing on the transformation of Palestinian national move movement, especially uh, with regard to the causes that led to the decline of the national movement. After decades of fierce anti-colonial struggle, countless sacrifices, and powerful transnational outreach and solidarity networks, the reality of the Palestinian national movement today is one tiered by multiple forms of fragmentations, divisions, and conflicting agendas, increasingly defined by narrow factional interests and exclu exclusionary politics. While cer certainly there are uh, multiple causes and external, internal causes that led to this demise, uh, one crucial aspect dealt with in this paper uh, is related to what we call in Palestine factionalism or al fasailiya Factionalism, that is the diversity of uh, political, ideological, and military ac actors within national movements, when misused for contradictory self-serving agendas and interests, would expose the movement to a variety of external influences and penetrations by the colonial and reactionary forces, which in turn would weaken the body of shared values and diminish the national and organizational fabric necessarily necessary to underpin the movement's anti-colonial struggle. In the case of Palestinian national movement, factionalism lies at the core of Palestine's long-standing crisis, which has significantly worsened since the initiation of the Oslo Accords uh, in the early 1990s. Factionalism is not a new phenomenon in Palestine politics. It can be traced back to the early emergence of the national movement a century ago, following the Belfort Declaration of 1917 and the unmasking of the Zionist objective to establish a Jewish state in Palestine, the Palestinians organized themselves in diverse movements and parties. While at the time, modern forms of political organization and ideologies took shape, such as communism, socialism, pan-Arabism, by and large, the political and ideological landscape was dominated by uh, traditional social formations, largely based on hierarchies of kinship, family, and clan. Traditional leadership that typically exercised power over the majority of the population often engaged in intrafamilial conflicts for political authority and social privileges, which led to a countrywide social and political polarization and disunity. This had weakened the collective organization and its struggle against the British imperialism and Zionist colonial establishment. Uh, this can be also one dimension among many uh, that perhaps weakens the Palestinian and struggle before uh, the Zionists, especially the ethnic cleansing that occurred in 1948, leading eventually to the uh, Nakba. Then, in the 1960s, with the emergence of the Palestinian national movement uh, along diverse ideological and political lines and the formation of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, this has integrated a new chapter in Palestinian anti-colonial struggle. It is important to note that the rise of PLO was largely influenced by the broader dynamic of third world movement, reflected in the myriad anti-colonial and anti-imperialist mobilizations prevalent in global south, including Latin America. The Algerian Revolution, Vietnamese resistance, and the Cuban Revolution particularly influenced the modern Palestinian national movement. The PLO then became uh, one of the most influential anti-colonial organizations at the international level operating transnationally in close collaboration with revolutionary movements worldwide. In Latin America, the PLO formed alliances with several guerrilla movements, including the Cuban revolutionaries, uh, Sandinistas, uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, and so on, among others, with some joining the PLO camps in Jordan for military training. Also, several Latin American revolutionaries joined the PLO and its fa factions, notably the, the Venezuelan uh, Edith Conti, the well-known Carlos, who led multiple international operations planned by the PFLP in particular, and who also was considered among the most wanted revolutionary figures by the CIA, Israeli, and Western intelligence agencies in the 1970s. But nevertheless, despite the PLO's historical achievements, fragmentarily political and ideological agendas limited its power. Uh, factional uh, divisions broke out among multiple issues, including, for example, modalities of anti-colonial struggle, whether it's armed struggle or civil resistance, 
international and regional uh, alliances with the progressive movements or uh, maybe to adopt a pragmatic approach towards reactionary Arab regimes and to interact with the U.S. and distribution of power within the PLO. The Palestinian left in particular was from the very beginning the primary victim of sectarian ideological disputes uh, which harmed its cohesiveness and affected its capacity to occupy a leading role within the PLO centers of power. By 1969, there were three major PLO affiliated leftist movements uh, that were uh, different in various, uh, in various issues, <coughs> but the PLP, Popular Front for the Exorbitant Liberation of Palestine, uh, remains the strongest with transnational re revolutionary reputation that inspired leftist movements and individuals from around the world. Nevertheless, the most crucial and enduring factional division within the national movements has been the power struggle between what I call statehood camp and the liberation of camp. The struggle began in an early stage, specifically in 1974, when dominant leadership of the PLO, represented by Fatah Party, adopted the so-called 10-point program. The program called for the national authority over any liberated part of the occupied territories. The new strategy diverted the PLO from its original uh, objectives and consensus, which advocated for liberation of the homeland, followed by statehood, whereas, whereas the 10-point program prioritized statehood over liberation. This has particularly divided the national movement for many decades uh, uh, <coughs> into especially two competing camps. The first can be called the statehood led by Fatah and the other liberation of court uh, uh, led by PLP. Anyways, to save time, I will skip this, but in the 1980s, uh, there emerged also political Islam in Palestine. These movements uh, and this added a new factional uh, dimension and ideological dispute within the movement. And uh, political Islam is represented mainly by two movements. One is the Islamic Jihad, which was originally influenced by uh, the, uh, the Islamic revolution in Iran. And then later in uh, 1988, uh, during the first intifada, uh, Hamas was established and was largely influenced by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And this, uh, Islamic politics challenged the historical dom dominance of uh, secular and national trends. Uh, but despite of that, we need to emphasize here that political Islam in Palestine is not homogeneous. Uh, both Hamas and Islamic Jihad have been leading vehicles for political Islam, but also they represent uh, completely or a very different uh, point of view on how to conduct the struggle and to collaborate with, with the PLO. But the most problematic issue when it comes to factionalization of Palestinian politics is related to uh, the Oslo Accords. And uh, uh, the Oslo has been very divisive and fragmentary on the Palestinian national movement. Uh, it allowed, in particular, the dominant leader of the PLO to return to the occupied territories, establish a self-governing authority known as the Palestinian Authority, and over limited parts of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And uh, this was said to function as uh, a state in the making, supported and sustained by international donors and international financial institutions, which played a key role in designing the PA structure and function. And this has exposed the Palestinian body politic to a variety of interventions and pressures by external donors. And uh, one of the most salient political implications of the Oslo process is that, is that it has structurally altered the very nature and manifold structure and function of the Palestinian national movement. Dominant PLO leadership effectively abandoned uh, anti-colonial struggle in favor of liberal state building within a context characterized by Israeli ongoing colonization and military occupation. This also was accompanied by a systemic, systematic marginalization of the PLO as an umbrella organization <coughs> under which the various factions operated. And uh, in Particularly then, we find that Palestinian left uh, has lost, uh, lost much influence uh, because the signing of the Oslo Accords was uh, uh <coughs> uh, 
during a crucial time in the uh, early 1990s that Christians were held up over the Soviet Union as a socialist bloc and the demise of anti-colonial movements around the world. Uh, so the left also underwent uh, a very difficult ideological crisis, was unable to uh, present alternatives, uh, to read the new reality, or uh, to become active forces on the ground. Uh, one crucial uh, condition here is the what we call the NGOization of, Palest of the Palestinian left. Palestinian left before also used to uh, have uh, very active presence on the ground with the grassroots through various uh, social organizations, trade unions, women movement, and so on. After Oslo, uh, this sphere was influenced by the conditionalities of international donors. Uh, they underwent restructuring of these organizations to become more elitist, uh, liberal, or even neoliberal, and uh, detached from the grassroots. Uh, so this was a history of the left, exactly how what happened in Kurdistan, but I think the same issue uh, can be also uh, seen in Latin America, East Asia, and other uh, parts of the world. And finally, we have Hamas, which uh, maintained a powerful influence on the ground and became a pillar of uh, Palestinian national movement. Uh, it operated outside the PLO, consisted the PLO and became uh, highly uh, respected among many Palestinians, especially among the poorest strata of the population because Hamas, unlike the left, has maintained uh, um, grassroots organizations that were close to the people. Anyways, the contradiction then culminated with the uh, division between Hamas and Fatah, which includes division of the territorial and political and also ideological division among the Palestinians. So uh, finally, I will conclude the situation of Palestinian national movement. I mean, organized resistance is in a miserable situation, unfortunately. But we will hear every day about resistance every day among the Palestinians. But unfortunately, an hour away from uh, organized Palestinian national movement. Thank you. So I will be reading a very abridged but hopefully captivating and coherent version of my article. So 24 years after unfurling the Puerto Rican flag and opening fire in the U.S. House of Representatives, Lolita Lebron once again cried out against Puerto Rico's colonial status. The liberation movement of the Nationalist Party of Puerto Rico, declared Lebron, conscious of its, if, of its historic responsibility to the fatherland aspires to, advocates, and works through all means of struggle possible, including armed revolution. Although written from her cell at the Alderson Federal Prison in West Virginia, Lebron's words did not, solely, uh, did not represent solely a private reflection on her involvement in the struggle for Puerto Rican independence. They also formed part of a larger legal defense strategy that sought to bring the case of all Puerto Rican nationalist prisoners before an international rather than US court of law. In this 11 page letter, Lebron reiterated her position and the position of her three fellow nationalists as freedom fighters facing unjust and illegal prosecution by the US government. Their legal efforts sought a tangible outcome, the unconditional release of Lebron and her fellow nationalist prisoners all of whom were charged with seditious conspiracy following their attacks in Washington, D.C., on Blair House in 1950, and against Congress in 1954. But even more importantly, the prisoners and their supporters worked to place the United States on trial for its continued colonial subjugation of Puerto Rico, a direct appeal against the removal of Puerto Rico from the United Nations list of non-self-governing territories. Throughout her letter to the International Court, Lebron urged the prisoners and those in solidarity with them to claim the authority to, quote, denounce the usurping empire before world and international consciousness, end quote. But buried within Lebron's impassioned appeals was a pervasive anxiety over what constituted a legitimate anti-colonial struggle, particularly the necessity of violence. Is this what is being demanded by the UN in order to demonstrate that a people should be free, she asked rhetorically. But her question warrants further reflection. 
in a historical moment concept that conceptualized decolonization as a visible confrontation between colonial authority and anti-colonial struggle, how could demands for Puerto Rican independence be taken seriously? Perhaps no other decolonization struggle captivated the attention of the United Nations and broader international community more than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So much so, in fact, that Lebron found herself corresponding directly with her attorneys about the question of Palestine. One attorney argued in a memorandum to Lebron that, quote, there exists the possibility in view of the situation of the PLO of succeeding in having the United Nations accept one of the independence movements of Puerto Rico. However, given the political conditions in Puerto Rico, this is doubtful, end quote. From this perspective, the case of the nationalist prisoners represented an opportunity to build upon and recreate the diplomatic momentum recently afforded to the Palestinian liberation movement by the United Nations General Assembly, namely the affirmation of the right to self-determination and the granting of observer status. In this presentation, I explore how Puerto Rican prisoners and their legal representatives found themselves engaging the question of Palestine as they strategized their own appearances before the international court. Whether as a conscious act of solidarity or not, from the late 1960s to the early 1980s, making Puerto Rico an object before international law, that is, making it a legitimate case for decolonization involved invoking the struggle for Palestinian self-determination. The formal establishment of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico in 1952 de declared the island to be self-governing while allowing the United States to retain ultimate authority over the territory's affairs. And this transformation had significant international ramifications. Recast as a decolonized nation, the United States successfully petitioned for the removal of Puerto Rico from the United Nations list of colonized nations the following year. For advocates of Puerto Rican independence, the free associated state was nothing more than colonialism by another name. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, the United Nations Special Committee on Decolonization repeatedly brought forth measures petitioning for the applicability of General Assembly Resolution 1514 to the case of Puerto Rico. Debates surrounding the resolution placed the island in conversation with decolonizing movements in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, and leaders of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party and Puerto Rican Independence Party, for example, spoke before numerous of these meetings. Other international forums came to locate the question of Puerto Rico's colonial status within broader visions of third world liberation. For example, the second conference of the non-aligned movement in Cairo, Egypt, endorsed and fully supported the right of Palestinians to self-determination while also demanding that the Decolonization Commission of the United Nations reconsider the case of Puerto Rico. Two years later, in 1966, the Tri-Continental Conference of Havana brought together delegates from a variety of nations and liberation movements to address the quagmires and excesses of U.S. imperialism in the Cold War, again including delegates from Puerto Rico and Palestine. Even the Tricontinental magazine produced annually, annual posters celebrating both Puerto Rico and Palestine's respective days of world solidarity. It was these political affiliations, party memberships, and cultural formations that formed the terrain of common cause that the Puerto Rican prisoners, their legal representatives, and those in solidarity drew upon as they brought the cases for decolonization before the United Nations. And they also contributed to the pervasive and increasingly urgent sense that imperialism was in crisis. And that urgency carried forth into the following decade. By the early 1980s, 11 Puerto Ricans were arrested in Chicago on the basis that they were members of the Armed Forces of National Liberation, or FALN. A clandestine movement committed to the strategy of armed propaganda in defense of Puerto Rican independence the FALN carried out over 100 bombings between 1974 and 1983. And upon their arrest, they swiftly declared themselves prisoners of war and, like Lolita Lebron and her comrades, rejected the authority of the U.S. judicial system and demanded the right to be tried before an international court. On May 16, 1960, these prisoners, I believe that's 1980, 
These prisoners submitted a formal petition to the United Nations in another example of Puerto Rican decolonization being understood in part through the struggle for Palestinian self-determination. And this manifested in three major ways. First, the prisoners frequently and unabashedly declared solidarity with Palestine. For example, the petition included in its appendix an FALN communique dated August 3rd, 1977, which avowed both independence for Puerto Rico now and victory to the Palestinian struggle. The ferocity of these assertions was due in part to the prisoners' unflinching position regarding the necessity and validity of armed struggle and ceaseless war. Second, in the parlance of the US government and mainstream media, these actions were the work of a terrorist organization and these Puerto Ricans were terrorists. The prisoners thus responded by declaring themselves freedom fighters, not terrorists. Along with their legal representatives, they worked to reassert the fundamental role of colonialism in armed actions, citing legal precedent. Quote, the unconditional support of the United Nations for the liberation struggles carried out by the peoples of Namibia, Zimbabwe, Palestine, and other newly freed or soon to be freed nations of this world clearly establishes the right to employ all methods, end quote. So thirdly and finally, the prisoners drew upon an increasing recognition of Israel as an aggressive imperialist state itself. Their petition to the UN, for instance, documented Haiti Beltran Torres' experience in the federal jail of Manhattan. Torres, who had been forcibly separated from the rest of the Puerto Rican prisoners, found herself monitored by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Fervently objecting to such surveillance, the petition claimed that, quote, unlike any prisoner, she must have all her visits approved by the federal police, who have refused all her visits, tauntingly telling her she could have a visit from an officer of the Israeli army, end quote. Although the petition did not belabor this point any further, it would presumably have raised alarm in its readers, particularly those from the UN Human Rights Commission and the Special Committee on Decolonization. So to conclude, both before the international community and within global leftist movements, the question of Palestine was understood as a quintessential coordinate of the struggle against imperial aggression. The Puerto Rican independence movement sought the same recognition, which at times manifested as, as a desire to replicate the diplomatic successes of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, and in other moments, their embrace of the Palestinian struggle reflected a maneuver through which to legally justify armed struggle. And again, in others, it involved infighting over what exactly constituted the appropriate strategy for liberation. In all these ways, the Puerto Rican independence movement encountered the question of Palestine and in the process made sense of its own claim to decolonization. Thank you. to press something? No, okay. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Alejandro, Sinan, and Omar for this opportunity. A conference that bridges Latin American and Middle Eastern studies is something of a um, moment I've been waiting for, for me, and I think for many of us here. So thank you again for the honor. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to say that what I'm trying to do today uh, during these few minutes is less to sort of impress upon you the academic nature of what has gone into this research and more to tell you something uh, about somehow the, like the beauty of uh, what this experience has been, uh, how it has been for me um, as a Palestinian and also as a researcher uh, to come upon this, this research both within Palestine and in Latin America. Um, so I hope you enjoy these photos from my uh, trip there in 2014 and I hope uh, you enjoy this story that I'm uh, here to share with you. By training and degree, I am a historian and a Middle Easternist, and then even just the Palestine guy, as some people have called me. But today I'm thrilled to be able to say that I also know a thing or two about Latin America these days. I acquired this knowledge through research and writing and through the meaningful connections I've made with a group of people who call themselves Palestinos Chilenos. 
The article I've contributed to this conference offers one aspect of this community's layered historical narrative that began in the latter half of the 19th century. In these few minutes, I'd like to recount for you the story of how I learned about this community and why I chose to explore its formation into a diaspora. My aim is to leave you wanting to know more. So if by the end of these few minutes together, you have more questions, I will be very, very happy. In 2011, I visited the Israel State Archives in Jerusalem for preliminary dissertation research. I spent <coughs> about two weeks sifting through very, very disorganized boxes titled Arab or Arab absentee documents, hoping to find something uh, worthwhile for a dissertation proposal. And in the third week, I felt like I stumbled. I came upon a folder marked Palestinian Organization in Mexico. In it were several documents, mostly handwritten, from representatives of different centros and comites palestinos across Latin America. Most were from the 1920s, and most were addressed to British authorities in Jerusalem. From Havana, Monterrey, and San Pedro Sula, to Lima, Sao Paulo, and Santiago de Chile, the authors of these petitions, all Palestinian migrants, were demanding that British authorities recognize their right to Palestinian citizenship and nationality. To my knowledge, nothing had been written about this. Yes, a dissertation topic was born that day, <laughs> but more importantly, I found a story that absolutely needed to be told. The following year, I visited the National Archives in London, and there I found thousands of pages of policy documents, declassified correspondence, and memoranda from British home, foreign, and colonial offices, all related to Palestinian citizenship during the Nine Day period. The documents revealed that throughout the 30 years of British rule in Palestine, British authorities rejected thousands of Palestinian migrants' applications for Palestinian citizenship following the promulgation of the 1925 Palestinian Citizenship Order in Council. Historians of Palestine thought this meant that very, very little had been written about specific implications for Palestinian migrants. The law was designed to prioritize naturalizing British, excuse me, naturalizing Jewish applicants for Palestinian citizenship over any other group. This fulfills Article 7 of the British Mandate over Palestine, which promised to, quote, facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship by Jews who take up their permanent residence in Israel. As for the thousands of Palestinian migrants across the world who had left when Palestine was still Ottoman, they were, as one mandate for the statistics said, patently undesirable. What I discovered in London during that trip was that, in fact, the narrative of the Palestinian right of return is, in fact, 23 years older than the one we are familiar with today. This is to say that 1948, yes, is undeniably a seminal year in Palestinian historiography, but so too in 1945. What was missing from my research was the Latin American piece of the puzzle. I had to know how did Palestinian migrants across 1920s Latin America react to the news that they were now in a sort of secluded, enclosed, legally distinct place, and that they were as one group of Palestinians as they could be in their own nation so far ignominious, are preserved in microfilm. Most Palestinos Chilenos live in Chile's main cities, Santiago and Valparaiso, but a considerable number also live in towns and villages scattered throughout the Andean foothills. I visited one of these towns, Iapel, about 300 kilometers north, north of Santiago, and was stunned by the resembl resemblance of the landscape around it to Palestine. The dry, crisp air, the steep roads no one would imagine could or would be built there, the limited but striking vegetation, and the mesmerizing hills that fold into one another that and create perfect shadows all day long. All of it reminded me of Palestine. It made sense to me then why a Palestinian migrant in the 1890s would choose to settle in this remote location after weeks at sea and a few more on in trains and on mules crossing into the Chilean Andes from the port of Buenos Aires. 
The story of the migration of Palestinians to Chile is, and elsewhere in Latin America, starting in the 19th century, is a familiar one. Like others from around the Mediterranean basin and the Old World, the promise of economic prosperity in the Americas was reason enough for Palestinians to board ships at Jaffa or Haifa and sail for the Americas. And like migrants of other origins, once settled abroad, most Palestinians worked modest jobs as peddlers, merchants, artisans, and they also returned regularly, regularly to Palestine, remitting money, picking up supplies, and encouraging relatives to join them in the new world. But the interwar years are where we find the story of Palestinians diverging from all other migrants. Prior to World War I, migrants in Latin America from greater Syria were considered Syrians, Arabs, or Turcos due to their Ottoman nationality. But the end of the war and the division of greater Syria into British and French mandates introduced new categories that redefined citizenship, nationality, and ultimately belonging. The League of Nations tasked these mandates with governing, militarily and administratively, territories formerly belonging to the Ottomans, including through the promulgation of laws affixing new legal nationalities onto the populations of greater Syria that would be authenticated with new passports. In a word, Lebanese, Syrian, Iraqi, Transjordanian, and Palestinian citizens were mandate creations. Chile's Arabic newspapers in the 1920s encouraged readers to visit the British and French consulates in Santiago to apply for their respective citizenship. As a result, the migrant who arrived in Chile from Beirut, for example, as a Turco, a Sirio, or an Arabe, could now add French Lebanese to the list. And this was recognized legally and internationally. Likewise, migrants who hailed from areas newly part of the British mandate for Palestine visited British consulates across Latin America to apply for British Palestinian citizenship. But unlike their Lebanese and Syrian counterparts, these applicants were largely denied their citizenship. As for why, applicants were told by British consular officers that too many years had passed since they had left Palestine and that they had therefore, quote, severed ties with Palestine. Or that they could not, quote, provide sufficient evidence for intent to reside permanently in Palestine. One group of Palestinian migrants in Mexico responded in a petition addressed to the British authorities in Jerusalem that these were, quote, accusations with no godly authority. Palestinian migrants immediately took to writing petitions and letters of complaint to British authorities and local consulates in London and in Jerusalem, demanding that they be, be given what they called their birthright. In one of these petitions, authored by members of the Centro Social Palestino in Monterrey, Mexico, and printed in Chile's al Watan newspaper in 1927, the center's president, Salaman Kanavati, or Salman Kanawati, declared, quote, we firmly believe we have a right to Palestinian nationali nationality and to be held as citizens of Palestine, forming an integral part of our common country to which we are tied by all bonds of our birth, our customs, our traditions, our language, and all the other ethnic and social elements which contribute to make what we call fatherland. Throughout the interwar period, Palestinian migrants experienced unprecedented difficulty when it came to transnational recognition, representation, and mobility as a new political collective. They effectively lost their rights to return legally to live, work, own, and, and inherit in Palestine as Palestinians. But as Kanavati's words show, something else happened as a result of these developments. A Palestinian diaspora was born in Chile. The 1925 Palestinian Citizenship Order and Council spurred a transnational campaign that urged those who considered Palestine home to fight for nationality and citizenship as natives of Palestine. Therefore, the different instances throughout the interwar period where Palestinians in committees, social clubs, petitions, and newspapers spoke of themselves as Palestinians rather than simply Syrians, Ottomans, or Arabs constitute the historical elements of this community's formation into a diaspora. Simultaneously, these instances contributed to forging long-lasting local, regional, and transnational solidarity. Indeed, the history of global solidarity of Palestinians over the loss of Palestine is also more than two, de two decades older, more than two decades old than, than is, excuse me, more than two decades older than is often discussed in Palestinian historiography. And this solidarity is in every way a Latin American story. 
Today, Palestinians, Palestinos, Chilenos, like many others in the Palestinian diaspora, feel unified by an ongoing and shared experience of yearning for a homeland that continues to suffer under an unfathomable occupation and to which their right of return continues to be denied. These Palestinian Chileans are vocal and they are political and they are proud of their heritage in a country that actually celebrates rather than silences them for being Palestinian. They take to the streets in solidarity with the Palestinian people. They hold public events that promote awareness about Palestine. They establish centers and organizations, even sports clubs dedicated to Palestine. And they actively honor the memories of their ancestors who lost everything a century ago by naming their children after them. Before visiting Chile, I never imagined that as a Palestinian I would share in such a deeply painful and personal reality with a group of people who don't speak Arabic and who live so far from Palestine. But in Chile, I discovered that Palestine is in fact fantastic and that the study of Palestine and its people, past and present, should expand accordingly. In other words, the study of Palestine need not be limited to the study of geographic Palestine and certainly not to the study of the pre- or the non- the story of Palestine and its people is found in the transatlantic steamships that docked at the ports of Veracruz, Buenos Aires, Valparaiso, and Vienna, where migrants arrived in search of opportunity. It is found along the dirt paths of Mexico's arid northern deserts and Peru's rugged Andean coasts, where peddlers roam from town to town selling Holy Land items. It is found in the microfilms and special collections of Chile's national archives and in the homes of proud Palestinos Chilenos who have held on to their grandparents, journals, Bibles and family heirlooms with which they came from Palestine. In Latin America, Palestine is everywhere. Our friend's stories are waiting there. Thank you. I don't understand. Thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate being invited to this conference. Um, and I have the slides, please. So I'm not going to read. I'm going to talk, because um, I also believe in other forms of literacy. Um, my I'm writing currently a book on Mayan and Palestinian literature not because conquest and settler colonialism are similar, but the colonial encounter with indigeneity has something to tell us um, about um, the, extension of the extension of colonialism to modern structural states that continue to be colonial, whether it's Mexico or the state of Israel. Um, and I want to say that I'm starting with a map that helped me think about and talk about mapping solidarity um, how this map, the way I envision what does it mean to have a relationship between Mexico and, and Palestine and to go through this gap. Um, but also it's a map where what we don't see, like what's wrong with this map. And what's wrong with this map is many things, <laughs> are many things. First of all, that there is, you don't see the 500 year separation between Mexico and Palestine. That a 500 years of indigenous resistance in the Americas to colonialism is absent versus like more than 100 years of resistance in Palestine. Um, and also the map is, is the map is very Eurocentric, like who's who's been taking us through from Palestine to Mexico through France. Not Andalus, um, not Africa, where there's more in common in terms of like decolonization movements and third world war, um, or even to Morocco, when you talk about Amazir and indigeneity in the context of Morocco, um, or, or even the war between Morocco and, and, and Spain and Melilla. So we have to go through the French. Um, <laughs> and I resist that. <laughs> so, um, but from, from this map is like, you know, what, what we know is not just what this map is not telling us, but what also we can see in this map is really the percentage when you talk about south to south, like more of like, is it east-west? Because technically it's still east-west, 
but it's to like what does he need to engage in himself to self construct sort of thing which is where that idea is. Um, so I want to start with um, the new map solidarity and it's not just like what we see on the map but also how we think along map and solidarity how we think and conceptualize and research and scholars with issues with the indigenous solidarity movement are showing us. So I'm showing two images of two 2014 from San Cristobal Chiapas in Tijuana, Mexico. And these were two manifestations of solidarity with Gaza. Uh, it was during one of the latest wars that kind of like started all around under war uh, back in the, you know, in 2014. So the first one we see kind of like the more classical example, the classical example of you know, from Patagonia all the way to Rio Grande, the classic Latin American solidarity with Palestine that historically has been there, the social movement with the left, um, you know, the kind of like un un unquestioned love and unconditional love and support to Palestine coming from Latin America versus the more, you know, more of an example of actually Spanish Islamism that we see with the indigenous Muslim community in Chiapas showing solidarity with Palestine. Um, so this is not just a classical case of, you know, the classical That, that the language is not new to us. But maybe what's new to us is the fusion of the kufiya in the form of like a ski mask with the corn at the bottom, the corn that came from, my from, from Mexico. And, and the corn that like as a maiz, which is like in Chiapas, it's actually not just a cultural symbol, but one of the size for indigenous resistance because with, um, what happened to my mic? Um, with uh, GMO and after NAFTA, there was more attacks on organic cultivation of corn. So struggling for corn became a struggle against neoliberalism. Um, the <laughs> Pavon have, and uh, Chavez Pavon have more murals in Palestine. This one was, was erased. Um, I don't have like his evidence to prove this. My guess, you know, in, in since Banksy came, especially to Bethlehem, and it became the world became a Disneyland, you know, it's kind of like everybody paints and every day there's a different mural. So it was, you know, de erased, but with other murals in less popular, you know, sites in Abu Dhabi, Kid Karim, in Kalkila, they're still there. Um, what is interesting is like that he, he painted the same mural after he went back to Mexico in a Zapatista community of Antique in Chiapas, and, but here it has four languages. It has Tutsil, um, which is also to exist is to resist, and it says Chik, Vokol, um, Hakuchel, um, and that's to exist is to resist it to Tutsil Maya. It has it in English, it has it in Spanish, in Italian, um, because if you go to Chiapas, you meet the, you know, the Spanish anarchist and <laughs> the Italian communist. Uh, but at the very bottom, you don't, don't see it, it's, it's there's a line of the Chiapas a Palestina, la lucha nos hermana, from Palestine to Chiapas to Palestine, the, the struggle unites us. And so it's the same iconography of Palestinian Sumud, uh, but it's happening in autonomous region in Chiapas in Mexico. And it's, it's not painted over a wall. It's painted over like a wall of an educational school. Um, now, you know, we always think, okay, is, is it a kind of like a unidirectional thing? Is there solidarity from Palestine? Um, now, when there's another mural in Palestine that kind of like evokes similar languages, and it's an Aida refugee camp. It's not the famous wall. It's just like a wall next to the barber shop. When you enter, you know, when you enter Aida refugee camp, there's a barber shop next and then like there is a, a mural and you can see here like you know they, they painted of 
um, you know, the, you know, the heart of Palestine with the heart of Mexico. And, you know, we're not going through France. We're going through MLK. Okay. So um, is this like, you know, does this mean like we can go connection between Ma Mexico and Palestine through black liberation? Um, and, you know, I would like to say yes, and it's amazing. And but I don't have enough information about who painted this mural. I know some you know, of the locals who are involved, you know, you know, kids who, when I asked it, you know, there's um, um, uh, Abudi El Aruri, who's like his father owns the, um, el, um, the, the barber shop. And he's like, oh, it's like the four Mexicans who came um, and then like other Ajanib, you know, <laughs> foreigners. But it's like, okay, who are these Ajanib? And then I was looking up the information. It was a US based organization in, in it's called um, Art Against the Wall. If I have that name correct, so it's a Massachusetts-based institution, and I'm like, was MLK imposed on this wall, or was it part of this wall? Okay, um, but regardless of the question, I'm gonna keep following on, on 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 this wall, on this mural, because I feel like more it's more of the engagement with like, what is this story telling us, especially that it's in either refugee camp and not in the big wall, and the way it's thinking about Mexico. Um, then you know, Chavez Pavon, he continued to paint. He still paints. He paints the same mural. To exist is to resist. He painted in Argentina at the Mexican embassy. He painted in Mexico. And recently, last year, for the commemoration of um, uh, Nakba in Mexico, he painted, he, you know, revealed this like new mural of, of Zapata. And what you see here, like Zapata with like the machete um, and the, you know, the rifle. And he has a slingshot in his deer pocket. So, like, this is the Intifada Zapata. <laughs> Uh, but this is, you know, Zapata who believed in Tierra y Libertad, yeah? This is like kind of like the revolutionary, like this is a liberation project, but it also centering the land as a, si a site of indigeneity, centering the land as, as something that indigenous people struggle for. Um, and, you know, at the machete, you can see like where more like La Tierra nos defiende in, in, in Uyama. Um, but it, it, if we think about like this mural and we think about like how as intellectuals or scholars, you know, think, thinking along solidarity, are we able to think about Parisian Zapotismo? Uh, what does it like look like? Um, if, as you know, as, as you know, uh, Karam, uh, uh, sorry, I'm confusing you with Karam, um, Astarik was saying about kind of like the factionalism within, you know, the Palestinian project. If Palestinian politics has failed, you know, what other vision, political visions do we have? Can, can Palestine think beyond nation states? And I think that has been kind of like what we can learn from indigenous struggle around the world. Like indigenous people are thinking of political structures that are, you know, because of their stateless position, uh, are thinking about political structure that involve autonomy that really go beyond kind of, you know, um, indigenous state uh, models. Um, and that has been also more of like how for me the solidarity between Mexico and Palestine has uh, along also like the question of the wall has been mobilized not just around the question of the wall between the U.S. and Mexico border, but how it's been also invoked in a struggle for immigration. So this was for a poster in Bolivia for a, a conference that happened in 2017, and it's for the conference of um, uh, the. Uh, it was a conference for uh, an, uh, for like my immigration, and it's called the People's World Conference, um, and like it called for like for universal citizenship. So here is like you know not two walls. So like it's the, the 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 parallel between the wall in Palestine and the wall in Mexico, uh, the, you know the intended uh, you know the wall being built in in Mexico and Palestine as 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 a way to kind of like I I move to a more concept of universal citizenship. Um, Another image that I chose not to show <laughs> um, is actually from another project that was done recently by Khaled Jarrar, who is a Palestinian artist, who actually did an installation at the U.S.-Mexico borderland between Tijuana and El Paso, Texas, where he took, um, he actually dismantled part of the fence in Tijuana, and he created from it a ladder. So, you know, he put the ladder at the border between El Paso and, and Juarez, so people can see beyond. And for him, that was kind of like, you know, like the dangerous, the most dangerous thing about the wall that you start believing it. So to the ladder is like which Palestinians also been using to jump over the wall and to cross, you know, the the border that wasn't there in the first place. Um, and I'm gonna end here like with an example of like here like it that the students for justice in Palestine, Vista, the Latin students, the international students, immigration students, a, a coalition, uh, the international students club at Williams College, but it's also a movement that's happening around 
other colleges in the United States with ac with activism about Palestine, were like you know during uh, you know Pal you know Palestine apartheid week education about Palestine. There was erect a wall as a form of, of protest. And so you can see the two sides of the wall. And again, we see the iconography of here of like we didn't cross the border; the border crossed us. Um, you know, um, Palestinian ma Mary being Palestinian, which upset a little bit the liberals because like how can Mary be black? Um, and then um, on the other side, we also hear again the same mural by uh, Gustavo uh, with like to exist is to resist, but also la insan gayr shara'i. Um, but you know, it's so it's like really the fusion of like immigration rights, indigenous solidarity against the wall for immigration, and I feel like they're really creating new borderlands in the way that you know um, defy whatever colonial structures marked this border to begin with. And I'll end here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's always fun to be the last um, discussant on the last panel of the day, but um, I hopefully you can bear with me. Um, and I'll just wait for the. Um, well, I think I'll start anyway. Um, First of all, thank you to Alejandro and Omar and uh, Sinan for, for organizing this. Um, my work is uh, attempting to basically dislocate Palestine. Um, and I'm interested, I have a book project that looks at uh, territoriality and colonization through the case of agriculture in Palestine. Um, and I'm interested in South-South uh, relations to the extent that actually they move through the North um, and I think what's particularly interesting is the way that South elites and South intellectuals uh, grapple with their relations to the North. I don't think that they ever really uh, succeeded in separating themselves from the North. Um, and I think that, uh, th and in a sense, a more interesting question is to say, you know, how were they grappling with um, their relationships to uh, the global North? Um, so I think it's particularly important to dislocate Palestine um, from my position teaching at Birzeit in Palestine because our s um, given the kind of uh, siege, in both uh, geographic and intellectual, um, of our universities uh, and the Oslo generation, our students are now born um, 1997, eight, uh, and post, um, they, they don't even remember the second intifada most of them, um, so they have really grown up in, in a regime of, of spatial control, um, which makes it very difficult for them to think outside of Palestine, and I think um, several of us are finding it particularly important to teach about other parts of the world in Palestine. Um, so um, I could talk more about that in the, in the question and answer if, if you like. Um, I'm still hoping for the... Uh Okay. Do I have no? This isn't it. Oh, I do. Okay. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. So. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, the United States began to intensively settle the arid regions of the U.S. West. Um, at the same time, agricultural experts around the world started to develop a new agroecological zone or a biogeographic zone, um, and uh, it's, they called it the drylands, um, landscapes that were considered too arid to be agriculturally productive in the, in the conventional sense. So these are crops that are grown without irrigation, basically um, rely on rainfall. Um, so without the use of irrigation, um, the agronomists discovered that these drylands could be rendered pr so-called productive through rain-fed agriculture, a combination of practices through which fields, crops, or fruits are adapted to rely only on rainwater. Um, and there's been a bit written about this in uh, U.S. history, um, but it's what, what is less known is how this um, reorganization of dis disparate ag geographic areas was reorganized into something I'm calling the modern dryland region, um, and it reshaped the environmental history of both the Middle East 
and Latin America. Uh, the drylands were a geographic region that cut across political and economic boundaries in Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Australia. Uh, Far-flung experts uh, are from around the world came to the United States to learn um, in the early 20th century uh, the, the ways of modern dryland farming. Um, and the U.S. settlement and colonization of the drylands, in fact, uh, brought two characters that are in the, um, in the article that I wrote for Nakla. Um, an expert from Palestine, Najib Nassar, uh, from Haifa and an agronomist from Mexico, Escobar, uh, into the global dryland farming development effort. And their role was more complex than simply serving as the local instruments for U.S. agricultural policy. It's easy to see them as kind of the local tools of American uh, uh, scientific and agricultural imperialism. And I'm, I'm trying to say that it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, in fact, these experts claimed that the dryland agroecological zone for themselves, they claimed it for themselves, for Palestine and for Mexico, uh, with the attendant tensions that uh, doing so does. Um, both of their research, interestingly, invoked a past glory of ancient practices in both the Fertile Crescent and among the indigenous uh, peoples of Mexico as evidence for the viability, the future viability of the arid areas. Both of them drew on this history. Um, and here, a more complex and nuanced understanding of settling and settlement and colonization that modern states engage in, not just outside of their own borders, but internally to their own, to their own, um, within their own nation state boundaries, um, is not something sim simply imposed from above, but also engaged with uh, around the world by different people, local um, experts, usually elites, um, and movements and traditions. So through analyzing the works of these Mexican and Palestinian researchers, the dry farming agroecological zone emerges not only as, an, as its own geographic region, but rather as a product of processes in which experts pr participated in developing and defining the dryland landscape. So in a sense, what I'm saying is that uh, Nassar and Escobar um, participated in making the drylands and did not simply implement a US uh, policy. And the importance of this um, uh, settlement and colonization project of the West uh, cannot be overlooked. Um, as Enrique de Sal um, has argued very powerfully, uh, centers of power cannot exist without exploiting uh, their margins. And here we find very unlikely margins in the figures of the Mexican and Palestinian early 20th century experts that enabled the U.S. dry farming project to claim its powerful center. Without its margin, the center wouldn't have existed. The, the, mar the modern dry lands uh, zone emerged both in Mexico and Palestine with the willing and active role of Escobar and Nassar and many others and within the context of an unlikely and uneasy relation to the U.S. colonization project, which was an internal colonization project. We're talking early 20th century colonization of the Western states, which had been skipped over um, uh, in the 19th century. Um, and so the discussion remains relevant within our present day discussions of a return to dry farming, um, which is now um, becoming increasingly important because of um, climate change uh, and the inability for irrigation to sustain our, um, our agricultural system. So I just want to uh, mention just a couple of quick things. This is um, a, a photograph from one of the archival records, um, a bulletin of the Dry Farming Congress in the United States, and it's a delegate from Brazil uh, addressing the assembly uh, at, at the Dry Farming Congress. Um, the Dry Farming Congresses were um, a late 19th century, early 20th century uh, effort uh, to provide the scientific evidence for dry farming, the machinery required, and it's um, and Escobar par participated in as an international delegate in 1908, 1909, 10, 11, and 12 um, in far-flung, fledgling uh, colonies like Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Billings, Montana. Um, Escobar, like his North American and Palestinian colleagues, turns to the antiquity of dry farming to make a case for its modern implications. Um, I just want to say one quick quote that he has that I translated from a, uh, a journal article called El Cultivo de Secano, um, which he says, we Mexicans know that our, in our Indians are in certain regions of the country conserve the moisture of previous rains well in the soil to use them in crops in the following year. Um, and he cited Palestine among other areas that have prospered in zonas de lluvias escasas, is what he calls them. Um, and then Nassar makes a 
similar kind of argument um, in Palestine. I'm skipping over a lot of detail here, but we can talk about it later. Um, when he translates in 1927 a, uh, an American text called Dry Agriculture, written by one of the most prominent um, American um, agricultural experts of the time, who was one of the founding um, people uh, and a Mormon in Utah. Um, and he translates, uh, somehow gets a hold of it in, in Palestine and translates it uh, to a Zira'a Jaffa, uh, publishes it in his uh, newspaper in Haifa and as a book in 1927. And comparing the Arabic translation to the original American text is a fascinating um, uh, enterprise because he skipped uh, Nassad, when he translates it, he skips over many of the kind of um, glorification of conquering the desert which I'm sure he found to be a very uh, scary proposition when he was um, faced with the Zionist um, claim of having conquered or being in the process of conquering the desert. Um, so I just want to um, end by saying um, both researchers wrote at times of great upheaval, uh, one at the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the other at the height of the Mexican Revolution bringing great anxiety about the role of agriculture in the internal colonization of land for political power. Both researchers saw their economic and social work to improve the viability of existing rural settlements as a political act for different reasons. And in making the connection with ancient dry farming practices in their homelands, Nassar and Escobar uh, engineered a new agroecological zone in the United States, the modern drylands, to bring about their particular territorialized political and social order. In both cases, the deployment of modern dryland agriculture was a way to secure political community within their own national boundaries. And the work of Escobar and Nassar and the relationship to the dry farming movement in the United States unseats common conceptions about our global scientific orders. Um, in the US-based center, a new US-based center emerges from the margins of Palestine and Mexico. And exploring these previously unknown connections between Escobar, Nassar, um, the United States enables us to see the powerful placemaking ca uh, capacity of this agricultural research, which I've talked about in an article um, on, on wheat also. Um, and considering the Mexican and Palestinian cases together develops our understanding of the global dryland ecological order that in a way would not be possible if the Mexican and the Palestinian experiments were considered in isolation. So um, I'll just run through a couple of these photographs from the, uh, from the text. Um, these are agricultural experiments done in Ciudad Juarez. Um, uh, Escobar had his experiment station there in the early 20th century. Um, and you can see them also bringing uh, farm implements from the United States. This was the famous Campbell method, which was used in Kansas um, and other Western states to um, uh, break up the soil in new ways. Um, this is uh, an excerpt from Nassar. Um, uh, and that's a picture of him on the left. He was very famous for other things in the Palestinian national movement other than agriculture. Um, and of course here he's translating um, uh, stati agricultural statistics um, from Kansas. Um, and here um, other um, examples from the original text that Nassar translated called dry farming on soil compaction and all kinds of interesting things. Um, I very briefly just want to end with a, a s very small anecdote about uh, research that I'm doing um, now in Palestine, um, which uh, w we were doing basic, basic stories. We were doing oil history and uh, our, um, our informant in this particular case, my colleague Yusra on the right, um, and I were interviewing uh, this woman who um, by most p standards in the Palestinian national movement um, is the kind of prototypical peasant woman who is holding the Palestinian national cause to the land, um, a, a, a very, very strong trope in Palestinian nationalism. And so we're interviewing and everything's going fine. And then um, somebody comes along and says, Alhamdulillah as -salam, like she had just come back from a trip. And I said, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the it got to the point where we figured out she had just gotten back from visiting her uh, kids in Sao Paulo. And um, she was going to be going back soon. So. Talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for.
such wonderful presentations. Uh, first, I want to thank the conference uh, who put together an amazing event, uh, and also to Sinan, who or, uh, organized this panel and invited me to, to be the respondent. Um, this is, in some ways, uh, for some of us who have been involved in this uh, conversation of Latin American Middle East studies, um, is a dream come true, especially here in the context of NYU, to, to have a conference of this nature. Now, I, I would like just to make a, uh, brief comments uh, about uh, the contribution of your papers, but also make some additional uh, comments. What I see in uh, your papers is uh, ultimately uh, transgression of what uh, the, uh, the history of area studies has taught us to think within narrow frameworks of uh, uh, nation state analysis and regional analysis. And once we just move uh, a step outside uh, of that terrain, we're supposed to be somehow in a different universe and in a different area studies. So I think your various examples, uh, which were uh, methodologically reflective of various uh, approaches from comparative studies to cross-regional studies to uh, uh, relational framework of analysis, I and, and most importantly, transnational approaches which refuse uh, the notion of um, uh, one, uh, one that has to do with uh, a simplistic nationalist uh, uh, f uh, definition of what identity is. And I think especially within the context of Palestine, precisely because Palestine has been suppressed, denied uh, uh, for so long, not only in the public sphere but within academia, that the investment in the idea of nationalism, precisely because of the persistence of the colonial uh, nature of the relationship between Israel and Palestine, that there has been even anxiety around the term transnationalism or transnationalizing Palestine. And I can tell you that in a panel, uh, maybe even over <laughs> 10 years ago, when some of us used the term transnational Palestine, there was, uh, you know, uh, natural uh, kind of uh, uh, anxiety. But I think we're at a point of the discussion, there is understanding that the transnational examples and approaches that you all emphasized are not, are not simply about, um, you know, uh, transcending the national as a mode of uh, uh, forgetting the colonial settler state but uh, or the colonial settler relationship, but rather about method methods of analysis. So transnationalism is not simply a descriptive term for the way bodies, people move across borders, but also how we understand. It's a prism through which we understand those movements. And I think in all of your examples, uh, uh, Tarek, uh, first of all, speaking about the way internationalism, uh, especially post 67, was formed, uh, and the way uh, conferences, solidarities, and uh, and training actually of revolutionaries uh, were uh, were not only cross border and took place both in the Middle East and Latin America, but they envision an internationalism. And uh, to evoke Fanon, of course, it was the uh, in some ways, it was the pitfalls of nationalism. Uh, so I think, I think one, uh, and I would pose it to all of you, where would nationalism <laughs> begins and ends, and where does internationalism, especially when we speak about the post-60s, trans transnationalism was not a term, internationalism and the tricontinental revolution and the third world, third worldism. So uh, it's not a coincidence that those terms exist, but uh, the f pan uh, and where would pan-Arabism would fit into this kind of anal retroactive perspective? Because you're, you're talking about a particular era, but I would like, especially for all of the of you who mentioned this period, uh, you know, uh, where uh, you know, I, because you're using the term transnational, and sometimes it's some of you, and it is. It is there is a certain kind of anachronism about the way the term is used because. So we have to think about where internationalism and wh how does it mean in, in relation to transnational perspectives. Um, the other element that I saw common to, to all of your uh, papers, and that's uh, 
in uh, especially in Sarah's work, there was also this kind of identification and solidarity that uh, you, you emphasize, especially in terms of Lebron and uh, the whole Puerto Rican. Uh, you know, just it reminded me of a Palestinian friend who's married to a Puerto Rican woman, and he calls his children Palerricans. <laughs> so I thought actually, you know, some of the, the discussion around uh, solidarity is sometimes more than solidarities. We now have to address the question of mixed population, uh, people who have multiple identities and are situated regionally. And I think that also came, of course, in Nadine's uh, uh, presentations, because you are speaking about a community. Uh, it's not simply Palestine in Chile, but we're also speaking about communities that intersect and interact with the you know, Spanish-speaking population, with the indigenous-speaking uh, population, uh, what would be the relationship, because we have to remember, and I want to come back at the end to that point, between indigeneity and the whole Spanish or Portuguese in the context of Brazil as also part of the colonial history of Latin America, which we cannot forget. And that's a point I really want to come later to. Uh, and Am uh, Amal's uh, talk, uh, you know, I just promised her that I can do that. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> you know, that actually uh, you're also speaking about the movement, and that's in that way you're also, uh, your analysis is transnational in the sense that you're speaking about the movement of uh, uh, artists uh, and how through visuality they end up uh, incorporating. If I, if I wanted to summarize uh, the images, I would, of course, would speak about the, between the corn and the olive tree, right? as the indigenous, uh, uh, not only symbols, but actually agricultural, which also, of course, relate to Omar's, uh, Omar's uh, presentation. Uh, so, you know, how do we think about the symbols? But in, in that image, that the, last, the last one you showed us, it is a kind of uh, 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 actually a hybridiza visual hybridization that highlights not only solidarity, but also the fact of uh, th that the very fluidity, the fact that artists are moving across borders, that they begin to form uh, uh, identities that are in dialogue with each other, that are impacted by one another. So it's, one can no longer just speak about separate identities and geographies, but I think your talks, uh, your various talks emphasize this uh, important uh, fluidity uh, of, of identities. Uh, okay, so now I want to come uh, to, uh, and Nadim's, uh, and Nadim especially, okay, uh, I, I want to just say, this is something that y y uh, I really wanted to, to, to comment because uh, I think the whole notion of the, uh, of the way solidarity also, in all your talks actually, the, the idea of solidarity with, with Palestine, Palestine becomes also a metaphor, a symbol, say, for its struggle, which is beyond the actual site uh, of, of Palestine. I just want to make a comment that you actually didn't get to speak about, but it, uh, it is present in your paper and actually in the various uh, discussions today about the term Turcos, uh, which of course we know is a misnomer and dates back to the Ottoman Empire and the movement of uh, and, um, immigration. Um, you spoke about its negativity as peddlers and almost kind of the, the, the negative stereotype of the Turco, the Arab in Latin America. But I also speak, want to speak about the other side of the term Turco as a term of endearment, right? Uh, it's kind of a self term, at least I can speak, you know, uh, where people are referring to themsel themselves, even if it's misnomer. Uh, that nonetheless they refer themselves as Turcos as also to assert an identity that has a particular history and it's uh, in its multi-religious and multi-ethnic uh, form because various people were uh, uh, immigrating and the majority in fact at that point were not as we know of Muslim background but of Christian and Jewish uh, background. So the Turco as opposed to the recent Muslim immigration of the past few decades also has uh, a subterranean, say, religious identity and the question of, uh, of the Muslim versus the other, uh, others of, Lat of uh, the Middle East have very different uh, place, uh, say, in the Latin American imaginary. And I want to come back to my last point, which is about the, um, the whole, um, 
history of Latin America itself, uh, because in the first panel, this whole question came about uniqueness. Is it a unique case? Uh, and uh, I believe it was um, uh, someone, I don't remember who it was, but said that actually, uh, no, there was solidarity with other, um, uh, other communities, with other intellectuals, et cetera, from the various uh, parts of the third world, Africa, Asia, et cetera. That's completely true, and that's important to emphasize. At the same time, there is spe specificity to the case of Latin America in relation to the Middle East, and that's Iberia. Mm -hmm. And Iberia is crucial in the formation of the Latin American imaginary, whether as a conscious or un uh, unconscious, as some work I called it, uh, the Iberian unconscious of Latin America, mm -hmm. both in its uh, very ambivalent and ambiguous relation to that, which of course, uh, uh, I c uh, in an essay I called it tropical orientalism uh, because uh, if you look for example at the work of, of, of uh, you know some Latin American intellectuals about their own history say in Brazil the Orient represents both the Iberia is both the negative thing that one wants to react to and negate it's that Moor, Moorish blood that one wants to reject but it is also the way in which one defines oneself vis-a-vis -vis the North. If we take uh, the Weberian idea of North versus South, it is precisely what would also be mob mobilized uh, uh, as sometimes as a positive ideal that our slavery, for example, was not as bad as like those people from the North because we have the flexibility uh, and we mix with the uh, indigenous people. So the final point is another misnomer, and of course, uh, just as the Middle East is, uh, <laughs> as we know, is a highly problematic term, so is Latin America. Mm -hmm. And coming back to the term of the conference, the Latin, of course, is the also the anti-indigenous term, because it is the very concept in which the Americas was determined and defined vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Spanish and Portuguese world. So if we speak about indigeneity, and that's what I would like you to respond to, and that is really the sp another specificity of Latin America that I would argue dif uh, uh, differentiate Latin America from the rest of the colonized world because it is also part of a colonial settler history, part of the formation of the Americas as a whole, in that way when the, the sem very same intellectuals and affinities that we were talking about, solidarity, Che Guevara, et cetera, when they speak about uh, resisting uh, American imperialism, they're also denying their own participation and their history of a colonial settler state. So where would the indigeneity fit here in terms of the colonial settler state in relation to Palestine? All of you. So would you like to a few answers before we get to questions, brief? Oh. Um, uh, thank you all so much. I was just um, wanted to ask, um, how do you all see um, the work and the frameworks that you all put together um, as being um, important and useful for contemporary uh, anti-colonial um, movements on the ground that are, um, or the ones that are fighting against anti-blackness? Maybe we'll gather and collect two, two questions and then have them respond. Yes? Thank you, Michael. I'm happy that you <laughs> I just thought I make it. Uh, it has long troubled me that the, uh, that the narrowness of the breadth of, our th of thinking in the U.S. on Latin America, Middle East, it, it, just, it just amazes me. A generation ago, there were mostly, overwhelmingly, right-wing military dictatorships in Latin America. And there was a sea change in that, and there were 10 socialist left-wing governments in Latin America. And yet there is no discussion in our country of that. Um, you know, that, that, that's one point that I want to make. The other is that I was wondering how the, uh, how the decline of oil throughout the world, and it's not declined yet, but it's <laughs> you can see it's heading that way, and the growth of renewable energy ha is affecting what's going on. I, heard, I know some in Venezuela, and if anybody saw Today's Times, uh, the right-wing student uh, rebellion, popular <laughs> rebellion, is, a, is uh, shaking up uh, uh, Daniel Ortega's regime in Nicaragua. So I was wondering how all of that, how uh, you would react to that. 
Hi, thank you all for your presentations. Um, my question is for Amal. Um, you, in one of your pictures, showed um, and questioned the connection between the Muslimness and the indigeneity, and, and you know, are they connected? Where do, where do people identify from? Um, and I wanted to bring it to Ella's point about Iberia and um, this kind of historical connection with um, an Andalus. Um, do, do, did you find or did you look into um, this particular Mayan Muslim community making those connections um, in their political solidarity, et cetera? Or do you feel like it's kind of still maybe more left Zapatista connections, et cetera? Maybe one more question. So thank you very much. Uh, you're very fascinating um, presentations. I had a quick question regarding, and I think uh, following up on Professor Shohat's um, um, last point, right? This, uh, so there seems to be a move, uh, intellectual, I guess, or I don't know how to define it, on of settler colonialism, especially by Palestinian academics. Very recent, you know, by a few, I guess. And there seems to be this rethinking of doing these connections, mainly US-based, so thinking about these native kind of academics, native, right, from there, from the Middle East, doing sort of reflecting back on the context here, right, being between there and here. But I was also very much, I'd be very curious to see how that also plays out, thinking about exactly Latin America, the South, right, thinking about that also different forms of how to map on these um, questions. And my question to you is more, you know, all of you, if you feel it, it, it pertains to any of you, is, is how you feel that move is kind of, um, has political salience, which is important, right? But also how much does it actually leave out or leave out of the specificities of the different contexts that we are addressing? And how you feel you could be rethinking, not re sorry, not rethinking, but how you feel um, you fit within or don't fit within this kind of move happening now that I think, I don't know if it's happening now. Or Thank you for this panel, it's really great. Uh, just one question, like I attended the first panel this morning, and um, like w what, are sp especially with this panel, like the, the issue that's coming up in all many of the papers is the issue of social movements, especially with Amal and Puerto Rico and uh, in Chile, like it's, but what's the, vo what are the kind of writings or uh, the way Palestine is being addressed from Latin America. Um, now I'm, I'm hesitating to say it, Latin America, from the <laughs> South. <laughs> so so uh, uh, like I wish there are more panelists who are from South America talking about Palestine. That would be the, the connection. But if, if, if from your research and from your writing, how, how are they dealing with these issues of social movements? How, 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 how are they addressing the question of Palestine? other than the Puerto Ricans who, which is really interesting, but uh, if there are other voices, thank you. You guys around? Go ahead. I could, um, so I'll try to address all the questions um, in one answer. Um, and so if Mike, bear with me, please. Um, I, we have a panel coming at Mesa. <laughs> it's called Palestine and Latin America. So I'm organizing it with like, we're gonna do two sessions five Palestinian scholars writing about Latin America, or engaging with Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, but also five scholars from Latin America and Caribbean writing about Palestine. So like one of the things, like you know, how we think about 1948, the borders of the US-Mexico borderland in relation to 1948. So it just really, just like, so it's more, I feel like it's more of a comparative reading, and this is for me where it, the concept of affinity comes. As affinity as like, there are similarities, but they're not, <coughs> we don't erase differences. And I think there's so much that you can learn from the, contra from the contrast. Um, as you know, for my research, I'm reading things like, ne like together. So I'm not reading like what Mexican um, indigenous literature in Mexico is talking about Palestine. That's what's interesting. I'm like reading how indigeneity is expressed in Mayan literature and how it's in, in Palestinian literature. And so like things like the comparison of the maize and the olive oil. Um, I think as a Palestinian, like I always get nervous when I talk about my research in front of other Palestinians, because I feel, um, you know, I always have to explain why Mexico, why do we have to go in Mexico? And I think it also has to do with like a crisis, I think in Palestine studies that reflects the crisis in Palestine itself, politically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like more of like, where, wh why should we look somewhere else? 
But you know, should we compare ourselves to Algeria? Should we continue to talk about apartheid? Should we talk about ourselves about the Af black struggle in the United States? Um, should we talk about Native American struggle? And I feel like we can do all of that. Um, and because I feel like they're connected in different ways. And it's not when you do that, it's not you're denying Palestinianness or the, the specificity of Palestinianness, but I think I'm also resistant as a Palestinian Falaha. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, you know, with very serious, you know, like my family didn't do Nakba. So I feel like in, in, in some ways, um, this um, resistance to the exceptionality of Palestine. Because I think when we think about solidarity, there are many cases of solidarity with Palestine. But is there examples of solidarity with, from Palestine? Can Palestine be in solidarity with, with other people? And what would that look like? And why is it important to have solidarity from Palestine? Um, <coughs> and I think this also brings me to think about indigeneity in the context of, of Mexico and Palestine. Uh, what is specific about the context of Mayans in Chiapas, where I feel like as indigenous people, they were not co-opted or integrated into the Mexican nationalism as the as the Aztecs were. So I feel like even like regionally, Chiapas is part of Guatemala also. So I feel like there's like a, a like a you know a, a, a an open borderland between Mexico and, and 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 Guatemala that speaks to like a more a Mesoamerican like regional and, and cultural and civic identity that really doesn't translate into like the you know the the the, the mechanismo. And even like you, you know, the paintings of Diego Rivera, Mexican muralism, all the images of indigenous people you see, they're not Mayans, they're Aztecs. Um, uh, for the Muslims in Chiapas, um, I've, I've been to the community only twice. I'm not an anthropologist. You know, I just been as, you know, I was introduced to them through a friend. I attended the memorial. I'm Muslim, they're Muslims. I don't have much in common with them. Um, but at the same time, I'll say two stories about how the community went through a lot of evolutions from like, you know, many, like they were became Muslim through marriage with Spaniards, but the Spaniards were white, but also like, you know, they treated them like they called their food mierda. Um, they really looked down upon them. Then they decided like, we're not gonna be Muslims to be, you know, it's like, we're not gonna be Catholics again. <laughs> so, you know, there was a first generation of a family that, you know, they send their kids to Spain to study Quran and come back and lead the community, you know, in prayers. And guess what? After they came back, they became Ahmadiyya. So they upset all the Wahhabis. Um, um, so, I, you know, I mean, so I, at the same time, like the community is gaining a lot of visibility through like, you know, whether it's covering, you know, Jazeera or, and, and I think there is a lot of misrepresentation of like the ethnic, like the, the tension that led to the migration of this community because they were evangelicals before they left out their communities and came to the outskirts of San Cristobal. Um, so I feel like even like their relationship to Islam is more of a very specific case of how they're thinking about you know, religion. Um, and I think, I think I answered all that. Okay. I, I, I'd just like to say that I think um, maybe in a w my role on this panel is a little bit different in, in that I'm, I, I situate myself in the academy as a historian. Uh, and that has in many ways limited the extent to which I can engage with contemporary Latin American and uh, politics when it comes to what is happening today. What has in fact happened during the Pinochet years in Chile when we talk about the Palestinian community, right? That's a big, qu it's a very compli complicated question that has often alighted when it comes to uh, the historical research um, component of my work. Um, which isn't to say that I haven't engaged in some capacity, right? Being in Chile, sp spending this time with uh, Palestinians in Chile and so on. Uh, but what's really interesting to get at uh, Ella's point about um, what it means to speak about Palestine transnationally, and as loaded as that term is, um, what it means for me is to, sp to speak about trans uh, Palestine transnationally historically is, is uh, very exciting, because what it means is that actually we can speak of migration studies, diaspora studies, uh, transatlantic studies, and so on, in the context of Palestinian migrants who, in the time period I'm looking at, were really up against a very powerful narrative that says they didn't even exist, right? So when we talk about Palestinians getting on ships, joining Lebanese, Syrian, Greek, Turkish, Armenian migrants heading west. This narrative is a very powerful one in the United States and throughout the Americas. Um, so to, to get at that time period in the 19th century, early 20th, and inject Palestinian migrants into that narrative uh, is, thank you, right? <laughs> is, is exciting. Um, I just, uh, just to point out also that the notion of diaspora studies is very much comparative. So what this opens up is really a beautiful 
opportunity to, to talk about uh, diasporas uh, comparatively, and in fact, to include, as I've said on different panels and has been said to me, uh, a sort of a conversation between a Jewish diaspora and a Palestinian diaspora, in fact, in the same time period. Um, Palestinian Jews, as an example, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, just to say something about the Turco term. Uh, so d from from meeting people in outside, of, well, the, the few days I had to be outside of the archives in Santiago is to, to get a sense of what this term has meant for Palestinos, Chilenos, it's, it's heavy. And, and if they, in the, in, the con uh, you know, in the context in which they've reappropriated the term today to use it as kind of this is us, this is our history that sets us apart from, not just Palestinians, sorry, but Lebanese and Sy descendants of Lebanese and Syrian migrants as well. Uh, that is certainly a, a, a phenomenon that I think speaks more to the contemporary realities of what it means to be a descendant of, mi of migrants of the last 150 years in Latin America and in, and in Chile. Uh, but from my experience speaking to or meeting uh, Palestinians in Chile, the term is heavy and it is reminiscent of difficult times, if not for them specifically, having been bullied in school as children, for example, and for their parents, uh, who would have been in the generation of the you know sort of the 40s onwards up until the, the 70s, who uh, whose parents, so the kind of the grandparents of the people I, I, I met, uh, were very actively trying to assimilate in any possible way in a Latin capacity. So changing names, uh, sort of hiding or denying in any way possible uh, that they are associated with that with with that negative term. Um, so I, th I just think it's fascinating. I hadn't actually heard of this, this reappropriation of the term Turco in a positive light today, so I will look more into that. Anyone else would like to say? Um, I can just briefly say from the point of view of intersection, the point of intersections and also hopefully trying to get to the question of contemporary Chilean work. Um, so my, my dissertation, which I'm in a really formative stage in, It also looks, so I, in, you know, this piece was looking at kind of the colonial political parties, like this really clear sort of a solidarity vision, um, but I have another chapter that's thinking about intersections and interruptions by looking at um, Puerto Rican and Arab American Palestinian students at Chicago, University of Illinois in Chicago in the 70s, right? Um, so there I'm kind of getting at this question of, I, I write through a protest and I think about what the comparison these Puerto Rican students are making to tell a larger story about how US power is operating. So they're thinking in particular about um, surveillance and police repression and they're linking this moment where they get penalized for participating in a protest to bigger concerns that are animating the Puerto Rican independence movement. And I bring that up to say, especially in regards to like contemporary framework that you know, so much of this dissertation was in thinking about the question of social movements. I got a lot of pushback that you know these are fleeting instances. You know there's not really sustained coalition building. But you know that it ended up being that that wasn't my question and not necessarily trying to trace this long history of like rise and fall of a social movement, but to instead ask again, when do these comparisons come up? What do they show us? What are folks trying to say about power? Um, so I think for the contemporary framework, like again we see this happening now with you know groups like Ana Maria that folks are thinking or what have you, um, to, so again, to think about what those comparisons, when they show up, what do they tell us, and then to also kind of think through the fact that so much of the historical work I'm doing is reemerging in a lot of these contemporary comparisons, so and also trying to have the dissertation kind of incorporate a lot of oral history type work, um, especially within Chicago, since that is kind of the mm -hmm. community that we see at work, coalition. Thanks. Okay, so before I, uh, I want to remind everyone that all the papers are available online at nakla.org and merp.org and also for sale outside. And um, so, and at six o'clock, everyone is invited to a reception at the King Juan Carlos Center on the seventh floor, 53 Washington Square South. So thanks to our panelists and discussant and thank you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What did I do? I don't know. Well, you sat next to Helen Shohat. I know. Yes, my dear. Are we good? Thank you, darling. Oh, I love you.
I know, right? Um, let me see. Oh, I'm on the mic. to the reception? Yeah. Um, I'm sure. Should. Uh, you're with your parents? Uh, 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 yeah. 